Before we get started with this episode, I have a few requests. Download the Talk Music Talk app. It is free for iPhone and Android, wherever you get your apps. Or you can subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. Once you do, just leave a rating and or review in the store to help spread the word about the podcast. Second, share this episode on social media if you enjoy it. Facebook, Twitter, however you like to do it. It will help spread the word about the podcast. And finally, I am in the process of acquiring advertisers and sponsors, and I need your help. Just take a quick survey on my website at talkmusictalk.com forward slash survey. Should take you 30 seconds or less, and it will be greatly appreciated. And now for today's show. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Talk Music Talk with Boyce. I am Boyce. This is my podcast. Thank you for listening. For the first time, listener, Talk Music Talk is a weekly music interview podcast where I have long form conversations with people who are connected to music from different genres, different backgrounds, singers, songwriters, music therapists, music journalists, and on episode 112. I had the pleasure of speaking to Mick. But before I tell you about Mick, who he is, what he does, Happy New Year to you. This is the first episode of Talk Music Talk of 2017. I hope you had a good 2016 and that 2017 will be even better for you. Let me tell you about the guest. And I couldn't think of a better guest to kick off the year. I know having him means that I'm going to have a great Great conversations for 2017. Looking forward to it. He got his start as a DJ, initially made his mark as a DJ. Musically, he has accomplished a lot. He has done DJ private events for Beyonce, LeBron James, Michelle Obama. He's done private parties for Time Magazine's The Time 100, MasterCard's Grammy Party, Vibes 20th anniversary party. So many parties and events. I can't even name them, but they're all on his web- website, mick.co. He's a music supervisor, but to call him a DJ is incomplete because he does so much more. It's just one of the many things that he has his hands in. Entrepreneur with companies like Dot Dot Dash and Anchor. He does brand consulting, just an all around creative person. Great conversation. We cover it all. We talk about how he got started as a DJ in Youngstown, Ohio, how he got started, influences. We talk about music, culture, creativity, business, being a pretty recent dad. All of that is covered in this conversation. And a key thing about Mick is that he is about he's a great example of when you open up your vision that you don't just do this one thing in his case you know just seeing himself as a DJ but seeing himself as a business and how that just opened up all these other opportunities and avenues to him and he talks about that in the conversation we recorded this late last year in his home office in Brooklyn great conversation great guy I know you're going to enjoy it. Here it is, without further ado, my conversation with Mick. On your website, you say that you're a musical storyteller. What is that? What does that mean? It's a big word. Uh That sounds a lot more exciting than it is. Okay. (laughs) But it's very true. Mm -hmm. Um, I can take people on journeys through music. It's a talent I was blessed with um, since I was a little kid, uh, before I even knew what DJing was, and... It's turned into quite a experience mm-hmm. as an adult. Yeah. How did you uh, realize that? When did you first find out? Um, that's a good question. I just re- I remember being in high school, and I always uh, I always um, used to want to like take cassettes and edit the music down for yeah. like our school assemblies and like plays and because I always felt like I had a better ear mm-hmm. than everybody else. I, I, I guess I did in retrospect, and. Um, from that point on, I kind of like bought turntables, taught myself how to DJ, and really kind of like figured out how to do it yeah. moving forward. And what was it like about creating moods or? Uh, yeah, man, it's just, it was, well, for me, it was two things. It was, it was making people's environments better, and it was also me expressing my creativity mm-hmm. in ways that I thought was really cool that none of my peers understood. Okay. So it's sort of like if you're playing music, if you play this song, people will 
behave this way or oh yeah absolutely uh, there's a lot of uh there's a lot of um marionette tricks uh, <laughs> that you can use as a dj to make people uh do whatever you want mm -hmm. what are some of those tricks um one i'm not proud of and i don't do it anymore uh -huh. but when i first the started djing man. and i grew up in ohio I would get booked to do all these things that I didn't want to do, but I did them because I needed money. Mm -hmm. I was in grad school. So I get booked to DJ these like skating rink parties for like kids uh -huh. uh, for on behalf of this radio station I used to work at, which was like the big rap station in Cleveland at the time. This is like 10, 12 years ago. Okay. And uh, maybe longer, actually. And I realized this is right when like the whole like Master P bought it bought it era was mm -hmm. really cool and like really thugged out aggressive music started going mainstream. And I realized that if I played X amount of these records that I didn't even like back to back to back to back to back to back, to back kids would fight. Okay. Yeah. So they would book me for these long ass events that like I get spoiled now. I show up now for like ninety minutes, but Back then, it would be like six hours mm. for like a hundred dollars. <laughs> it was just like, but at the time, it was amazing, you know. Yeah. But I'm like, I still didn't want to be there six hours. So when I would get like tired, I would just play these songs in a row so people fight, so the party would get cooked, okay. cooked, shut down. <laughs> and I remember this one kid like took off his skates and he was like swinging them around his head yeah. like a, like a lasso, and he just clocking people yeah. with roller skates, which I'm sure truly hurt the yeah, victim I but i got out of there yeah and it didn't cut my money mm -hmm. because it wasn't my fault yeah. technically <laughs> so <laughs> no one knew mick was the master of puppets <laughs> it was great i got out of there three hours early some kid went to the uh -huh. er and i went home yeah. sounds like a plan dude it was fantastic okay. that's exactly <laughs> I, I recommend that for everybody good so uh, i've never shared that story before oh, really? like, okay. so that's a yeah, first time yeah. Good. So you're from Youngstown, Ohio. I'm from Youngstown, you're Ohio. From Pittsburgh, so we're not too. Yeah, it's like an hour away. Not yeah. even like 55 minutes. Oh, is it that? I don't know if I've ever been to Youngstown. Mm. Well, what is Youngstown? <laughs> I've been to Cleveland. I've been to Columbus. Youngstown's cool, man. Like, it's not like a lot to do, but it's just like a good. Um, the people there are good, you mm -hmm. know. It's that old, like you know, steel belt kind of like yeah. same as Pittsburgh. Like yeah. they had all these steel mills and all that stuff, and then it all shut down and. Kind of went into doldrums a little bit, mm -hmm. and now it's like digging itself back out. But I love going home. You know, I love going home for Christmas. I love going home for a couple of days and just reminiscing. Yeah, and it, it, there's a real there's a grittiness there mm -hmm. that I really like. You keep in touch with a lot of people there still. Or? Um, no, like my family. Mm -hmm. uh, my mm -hmm. my parents still live there. Okay, my, I have cousins and nephews and stuff, and they live there. Okay, and we talk. Brothers, and sisters. My, I have a sister. She okay. lives in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Okay, and, you know we talk every day, but uh, that's that's a bit you know. So it's still Ohio. Yeah. So were you a musical then? Like when did that start? Yeah, man. I was in. It's funny. I was. I mean, I played piano like by ear since kindergarten. Yeah. And uh, then taught myself how to play drums, and then ended up getting like lessons on top of that, and then leveraged that into like teaching myself how to DJ. Mm -hmm. Um, never had lessons on that. It just that was completely self-taught, which I loved, uh, and it just kept going and going and yeah. going. So when you started piano, like how was that? Your parents wanted uh, to my play grandma had ass? a piano, okay, and uh, I would just go like mess around on it when we would go to her house, and I sucked, but then I taught myself like chopsticks and yeah. then Happy Birthday, and you know, I was never really good at piano. I was all right, you know, mm -hmm. but. It was enough to give me like a basis of like music okay. and theory and tones and keys and notes, mm -hmm. which has helped me a lot in life. Yeah. So how did that go? Like, when did the DJing start? Mm, or the, high or school. The in high school. Like, I started like making mixes with cassettes mm -hmm. and laying like, oh, I'm going to extend this drum beat or I'm going to bring this verse back a few times because I would watch DJs like on Yo MTV Raps. Yeah. And I didn't understand any of that. This is pre-internet. This is pre-everything. I didn't have any lessons. Mm -hmm. Just figuring it out. And eventually you just piece together one iota of information and another minuscule amount of information. And then you eventually kind of get, um, you figure it out, yeah. you know, in your own way. And it's actually different than how everybody else figures it out. But that's what makes you unique, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So it was just more from watching as opposed to like did you have any mentors or someone you could check with? Um no, I uh I did not have any mentors in person. Um Jazzy Jeff was a influence. Mm-hmm. Is the reason I wanted to become a DJ. I bought this tape. I still have it in my desk drawer. Yeah. Um, I bought this tape. I'm going to actually be annoying and make a noise uh, on your podcast I'm just because it's, re- it. it's relevant. Yes. This is the tape. I want people to hear that, that I'm clicking true. a tape from my desk drawer. So I'm breaking all the podcast <laughs> rules here with background noise, but it's important. Uh, sometimes and, people say something, they don't mean it. But no, no, this no. This is no, proof no. right this, here. This shit is the real tape. Yeah. Could, look at there's nothing left. Yeah, it's all worn I got off. this at a Kmart. It's worn off. I got this at a Kmart in Naples, Florida, okay. my grandma's house, and brought it back and listened to it. And I was like, "Holy shit, okay. DJ!" This Which is, one is that? He's the DJ. I'm the. Oh, rapper. okay. Yeah. And um, taught myself how to DJ based on listening to a lot of this stuff okay. on this tape. Still can't do half the stuff that he does on this tape. <laughs> but he's become a, a good friend and a mentor as an adult and a collaborator. Mm-hmm. And that's like a for me. That's amazing. Yeah. What was it about his style that you? We're attracted to just musical very clean very musical mm-hmm. it just like a lot of people who are specialists in any field in the world they don't know how to make it fit into the overall environment they're in yeah you could be a painter you could be a dj you could be a uh whatever you specialize in and but it if you could take that level of proficiency and and make it fit into the music you're scratching on top of okay. or the wall you're painting on mm-hmm. or you know the sh- the floor you're dancing on like if you c- you sh- your talent should enable you to kind of like blend in but still stand out okay. versus like oh I'm the best scratcher in the world I'm just going to scratch 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 and then like who cares nobody mm-hmm. wants to hear you do that for 2 hours but yeah. if you could do that within the constraints of the music and still shine then you're much more talented than the guy that needs to just have the spotlight solo yeah. guy all the time. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So is that sort of like when you see guitar players, they know like, you know, a hundred mm-hmm. chords and they're just like, that's the same noise. Exact right? thing. Same exact thing. Anybody could do a good guitar solo if it's just no music playing. Yeah. But if you could make your instrument stand out in a group of seven other people and stay within the rhythm and the tones and the feel and the vibe of what they're creating, that's what makes you a mm-hmm. star with it, not just like when you're sitting at home in your room playing a cappella or whatever. Yeah. Be, so. so are you looking to be like in high school thinking about being a DJ or mm-hmm. something musical? No. I just thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. I just, and I loved music. And it was a way I could like totally express myself musically. Okay. So I was like a big fan of it. I was, and then when I went to college, it was just a way to make me kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Cause I was a loser in high school. And, um, mm-hmm. When I went to college, all of a sudden I was cool because I had two crates of records. Yeah. So it was kind of awesome. And then, um, you know, I've told the story a zillion times, but I used it to pay for grad school. And then at that point, I finished that and I was like, oh, maybe I should do this. Mm-hmm. And I did it. So what, what made you a loser in high school? I was fat. Mm-hmm. I was uh, antisocial. I was a dork. Mm-hmm. I was really smart. But not like cool smart. Okay. Not like this quarterback that's also smart. I was like the guy who's fat and dorky in the band playing drums. Okay. N- not and not in a rock band. Like I'm talking like marching band. Yeah. Like, I was in a marching with a, band with a cowbell <laughs> on my drum. Uh huh. Like you know, like there was nothing awesome about any. Of yes. This, you know, in in terms of like what whatever is quote unquote cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it all worked out in the end. You know, I think I turned out all right. Yeah. But it's funny. When I when I ret- when I think about all that, and as a parent now, I, I think about that too with like my, my son. So I just I'm just telling him like, do what you want, dude. Yeah, you know, work out some way. Yeah, yeah. Were you thinking about was it going to be like a reinvention when you go to college? No, 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 not at all. Where'd you go to college? Um, school called John Carroll. It's in okay. Cleveland. I didn't know at all. I just know that when I graduated high school. Uh, when I graduated high school, I kind of like remember our senior band trip it was like a week after we graduated. We went to Cedar Point, which you probably know. It was yeah. like an uh, amusement park. And I didn't even have anybody to like sit with on the bus. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I was, yeah. like, it was that socially decrepit for me. Yeah. Uh, and then that was, I guess, would be June. And then two months later, in August, when mm-hmm. I moved into my dorm, same dude 
but I, nobody knew me and I came in with two crates of records and a far side t-shirt and I was like <laughs> the coolest dude on my floor <laughs> and I was like this is a real story yeah. like it's it's insane like I literally you. my mom drove me to Cedar Point that day so I could play with the marching band and we drove home and I just said I had something to do yeah. and I couldn't stay but it was because I didn't want to deal with that social awkwardness okay. right of, of like you know nobody wanted to sit next to me on the mm-hmm. bus was, and you know it was just weird you know and, and, and then two months later I'm like whoa we had to go to this kid's room I forget what, room yeah. number, what my room number was but they got records he's cool you know mm-hmm. sit at our table Let's, and I was like whoa yeah. you know girls talked to me no girls ever talked to me in high school <laughs> it was nuts it was cool it was really cool so how does that feel like to go from that to being now cool and then also now currently now being say like an arbiter of I mean, taste and style I, la- I laugh when people think of that but i guess it's true like i mean I, i've been really fortunate in that regard like you know i'm pretty much the same person mm-hmm. like, if you look around my office dude it's like toys and comics yeah, yeah. and i'm it's like i'm a big nerd the, the, the difference is like i think society caught up okay yeah. to nerd culture so i could have an office full of vintage toys mm-hmm. and comic books or real books, if you will, yeah. you know, if you if you or, or whatever it is, and techie stuff, and you know, fifteen twenty years mm-hmm. ago, you were the antichrist. If yeah. you, you were of cool, and now it's like, oh, Comic Con's like one of the biggest things of the year in entertainment, and every single person wants to be a tech entrepreneur mm-hmm. and being an author and being a creative and being a, it's like that's <laughs> what everybody wants to do totally. So it's just awesome that it kind of like pop culture uh, caught up to it. Mm-hmm. And what did you uh, go to college for? Uh, marketing. Okay. Yeah. So did you? what were you thinking of doing with that? Just being a boring old Ohio white person. Uh-huh. <laughs> like insurance salesman. I don't know. Yeah. Like uh, I, whatever, whatever people do there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I graduated college in 2000. The world was different. There wasn't a lot of creative industries in the world, let yeah. alone Ohio. Like advertising and marketing weren't this amazing, fun thing and it wasn't mm-hmm. this mystified madman kind of situation either and there weren't social things the internet just started okay like none of this stuff that people uh <laughs> sorry none yeah, of this stuff yeah we have cats that are climbing <laughs> all over the equipment so i'm glad as long as i'm not hitting the, the stop button no, we're um you know so i graduated college and actually that was the uh inspiration for me to go to grad school because i was like ah this sucks I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go do something I don't want to do yeah. yet. Let me buy some time. Okay. DJing was going well. I was like, I could put myself through grad school paying for paying for it with DJing. If I went really slow. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like bought myself like four years, man. I did yeah. like this four year part time MBA thing and kept everybody off my back because I was in grad school. Um, just DJing, mm-hmm. figured out brand building. I didn't know that's what I was doing. Okay. I just, that's what, that is what I yeah. was doing. But I didn't know that at all. And, uh, you know, then I finished that and I was like, you know what? Maybe there's something here. Yeah. And uh, it worked. Yeah. What did the uh, brand building before had the name <laughs> look like? In which way? Uh, what were you doing? Like, to, I guess you were building your brand, but what were you, the things, some of the things you were doing? I mean, I just built a local, that. it was a local business, really. Yeah. You know, I, I was a big DJ in Cleveland. In certain aspects, the biggest DJ in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean, I don't mean that egotistically, yeah. it was just factual. Like, I was on the radio five times a day. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, excuse me, five times a week, six times a week. Uh, and I was still doing college radio at the time. So I kind of had like this underground root thing that kept started me. Yeah. Then I had this like commercial, jiggy, top 40 thugged out kind of uh-huh. like persona also and i was just also really good at like networking so i had three scenes like if there was like an underground scene like you know if there was like a day la soul concert mm-hmm. like i was gonna open it. okay but then like all the cool clubs in the city i was doing but then because i was smart and educated and could sit down with somebody and have a conversation mm-hmm. at a lunch meeting and be presentable i was able to do like fundraisers at like the rock and roll hall of fame yeah. or like charity things and so I kind of hit all three levels, okay. and that was great because nobody else was able to hit all three of mm-hmm. those. That taught me a lot about 
you know, oh, self, self, being self-managed is yeah. kind of fun. It's like running a business. I didn't think about it like that at the time. That didn't happen until way later, but that's, in effect, what I was doing. Okay. I didn't know that people had managers and publicists and <laughs> teams. Mm. And you're doing all that. It's just me, so, yeah. you know, but I realized I loved it, you know, and that ended up becoming, like, the secret to my success was, like, I could talk to the kid that just spent $20,000 on bottles at a club, which is ridiculous, by the way, mm-hmm. and I don't see any of that money. <laughs> And I could talk to the CEO of a company or to, um, you know, the person that, the chairman of the board of this hospital that's doing a gala, you know, yeah. and I could talk to everybody, you know, and, and, and uh, it was, that's, that to me is the secret to my mm-hmm. success. So are you thinking at that point, if uh, you're a big fish in a small <laughs> pond, like, what's the next step? Um, no. Like where to go from here? No, I just thought it was going to. At that point, before, after I finished grad school, or before, uh, like during grad school. No, I was like just that. thinking I'm just going to go get a job. Okay, that's what I was thinking. So about almost to the end of grad school, and then um, my teacher, uh, and I've told this story a million times to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, oh, no, my teacher said, "You have to kind of like grow up." because you can't be creative and do all this fun stuff and have a real career. Okay. You can kind of just be what um, everybody else in my grad school class was yeah. doing, whatever that was at the time in 04, 05. Mm-hmm. So that was like, I don't know, what did you do at an MBA in Ohio in 04, 05 before social media and before uh-huh. this, this like creative culture that we live in? It was just like insurance companies and mm-hmm. real estate and GM. and You knew you didn't want that. No, but you know, I mean, I would have done it, mm-hmm. but um, the teacher, it was embarrassing. He basically called me a loser without saying it. He was just yeah. like, what, he's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you know, you can't do that. And I disagreed, and that was a motivational point for me. Mm-hmm. So what happens then? Like you, you finish school. Finish school. Um, started traveling a lot more for DJing. I was doing mixtapes at the time. Mixtape culture was really mm-hmm. big, so I was able to get booked at like, in New York a couple of times a year. She so yeah. started coming out here. I got booked at like All-Star Weekend. Like the same, the, like the stuff that's like, you know, very rap-centric mm-hmm. stuff. But I was able to use it to build a bridge and just started getting my name out there, man. Yeah. And it just kept growing and growing to the point that I felt like I could make a move here to mm-hmm. New York. I did. When was that? Uh, oh, eight. Okay. And had no money. I mean, I had money. Like I had money enough for like a couple months here. Like I didn't have like real money. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe Cleveland it was Cleveland real money okay. <laughs> in, in that year I don't know it anymore I'm sure everything Cleveland's like like my rent in Cleveland at uh-huh. that time I was paying twelve fifty for okay. a three floor uh, like three floor <laughs> suite with a roof deck uh-huh. downtown Cleveland okay. twelve fifty. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Like in New York, you'd get a closet, you know, and it's it they've went up now in Cleveland. Cleveland's a lot better now, but um, there's a lot more to do, a lot more going on, which is great. But at the time, you know, then you move here and you downsize your apartment in half. Mm-hmm. You're paying your rent in triple. I was like, whoa, yeah. what did I sign up for? <laughs> but it worked. Yeah. Were you feeling like maybe I made a mistake? Or no, you know, I never felt like that. I never felt like I made a mistake. Mm-hmm. There were times where it was great. There were times where it was kind of dry. I have a philosophy that I've said this before too. I don't think I would have made this move or had the balls to make this move if I didn't have a backup in education. Oh, okay. And a lot of people say, and I, that you should just throw caution to the wind and follow your passion mm-hmm. and just do it and live freely and yeah. all that shit. No, not me. I don't. I, that doesn't work for me. Like I was able to come here and take a chance and really go balls to the wall with it because I knew if everything failed, I'm good. Yeah, you still got your... I might not yeah, be yeah. great, but I'm good. And I might not be as creatively fulfilled as I'd like to be, but I'll be good. Mm-hmm. You know, I know I'd make at least $80,000 a year in Ohio yeah. in 2006, which is like you could live. Mm-hmm. You can't live great, but you could live. Like I wasn't going to be homeless. I wasn't going to be broke. Yeah. So I'm good, right? Yeah. Like, you know whatever and uh it worked the other way fortunately for me but i don't know that i would have done that without having that fallback plan Mm -hmm. okay because you know sometimes people feel like if they yeah they don't need the net or the net's not even there Mm -hmm. and that they're just going to do it anyway see what happens 
yeah, it's cool like to know that about yourself. My mind doesn't work that way. Yeah. I was like, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so was there something that happened in New York where it's like, okay, you've turned the corner and that? Um, in which way? Uh, like success or that you made uh, the right decision to move. I don't know. I think I'm still waiting for that. Okay. <laughs> and when I look back linearly, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I guess. Like every year I see growth, yeah. you know in the rooms I get to play, the clients I get to work with, you know. Mm-hmm. A couple of years ago, I had an epiphany where I realized I was an entrepreneur and my DJ career was my startup and mm-hmm. I'd been running it since 05 as a successful business. I yeah. never thought of it that way. I thought of myself as a DJ. Okay. And um, that's the wrong way to think about mm-hmm. my career. It was, I run my own business. DJing is just some shit I show up and do. Okay. That was the biggest shift I had, mm-hmm. and we can get into that more later. But like that to me was like the mm-hmm. moment where I was like, "All right, now you kind of have it figured out what you're doing." Okay. So how did you get to that shift, and then what happens after that? Um, I just you know I've always been well read, and I've always been aware of what's going on in like business and marketing and all that. And all of a sudden, everybody was an entrepreneur, and everybody mm-hmm. had a startup, and everybody was creative. You can't walk to the airport without seeing 29 books on it, and mm-hmm. magazines, and I'm like, whoa, I want to do that. I, then I was like, whoa, it, I do. Yeah. I just didn't make an app or I didn't make a website or I didn't make a, you know, a, a, a juicer or, you know, or a phone. Mm-hmm. I made a, I, I, sh- my, I have a product, but my product is me. Yeah. But if it wasn't me, I'd be the guy that you'd look at as the business guy. Okay. Because I'm also the product as well. People don't realize it like that. And I've done tests on this when I tell people, like, mm-hmm. when I meet people, like, sometimes I tell people what I do on airplanes or whatnot. Yeah. And sometimes I tell people what I do during the day, and I don't mention I'm also the guy that goes out at night and does it as okay. well. And it's a completely different perception. Mm-hmm. Like, if I tell people all the, ac- all the accolades and attributes of my career that I've gotten for my artist, uh-huh. you know, people are like, holy shit, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's an interesting perception Mm -hmm. you know and does that open you up like once you make that realization how does it open up your career just made me realize that i'm successful Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. i have a good formula and a good method to what i'm doing Mm -hmm. and that i can grow it and scale it and i could use it to get that's that's when i started getting into other opportunities okay because i thought of myself different you know Mm -hmm. the least exciting part of my day now is dj okay I love it. Yeah. When I'm there and in that moment. Mm-hmm. But I don't sit around the house like, I can't wait to okay. DJ tonight. That never happens. Yeah. Was it ever like that for you? Yeah. When I have any gigs and when I just love the culture and mm-hmm. I like never didn't know anything, I was like, I would DJ for, for free. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still would DJ for free if I felt, if I felt that urge. Like, I don't, I, 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 it's a blessing I get mm-hmm. to do this. But the deal making and the the career creating and the brand relationships and the networking that's what that's what gets me up in the mm-hmm. morning and what flipped it for you that it wasn't less passionate the dj what do you mean like when did that change or do you know why it changed i mean it's not that it's less passionate mm-hmm. like i love it you know it's just yeah I've been, I've been doing it since i was in high school okay you know, it's still really fun. And when I'm there, I give 200%. Mm-hmm. And I walk out of there all excited that I made people yeah. very happy. It's more so like, I'm not like, oh, I'm really excited to okay. walk out of the house right now and go do this. Yeah. When I, because my the way I express my creativity now, I've, I find it more interesting doing the daytime stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if I didn't do the nighttime stuff and do a good job of it, the daytime stuff wouldn't Yo. be there either. <laughs> you know? Also, my body doesn't like to be up till four or five in the morning Uh, anymore, which is required of a DJ. Uh, I mean, it was now. Now it's that's only two three times a month for me. Mm -hmm. I don't. I do mostly brand stuff, so it's like it's it's early early schedule, early evenings. So, what is some of the brand stuff you're really excited about? Um, I just love the collaborations with brands in any way. I like to DJ for people who. Or I'd want to be friends with in real life, you know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of how I gear what I like to do as far as like who I want to work with, how I want to work with them, where, where in the world we want to mm-hmm. do this at. And, um, 
sometimes they come to me sometimes I go to them uh, all sorts of ways about it you know but I've gotten to work with amazing 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 brands and I consider it a real you know a real privilege mm-hmm. like, so what do you do like, like when you why do you think they're choosing you to work with to collaborate because oh, bald white guys are where it's at man <laughs> uh, I don't know that's a good question you know why because um, I'm good at what I do it could be better could be great at what I do mm-hmm. if I probably didn't manage the daytime aspect of what I do. But I'm good to great. You mm-hmm. know, great on a I'm great on a good day. Uh-huh. I'm good on an average day. Okay, I'll take that because I'm really great at what I do during the daytime hours, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was like um, I guess. Wait, what was it? What was yours? That question, so I can hone in on this. Okay. Oh God. I mean, we're kind of. I mean, I kind of get what you're saying. Like, yeah. For me, it's just like I. Why do they want you? That's basically it. like. You what know, do you bring? Because I'm really. Besides I'm good at maintaining like, relationships. I care. I care about my clients. My clients, and then by default, care about me. Because mm-hmm. I truly go through loops for them and whistles and bells that nobody else would do. I've taken four planes to get somewhere once because of a snowstorm mm-hmm. for a gig that didn't even pay a lot of money. Okay. But it was, you know, I gave my word, right? Most people would have kept the deposit and blamed it on an act of God. Yeah. I didn't. And this is like verified. Like New York Times had an article on it. Mm. Like, you know, like Not that that verifies it, but I guess if it's written, <laughs> if it's, written it's true, right? Um, so I do stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I love creating real authentic relationships and friendships. And I know I always say this a lot too, and I've probably written it a few times, but... When we had our baby shower a year and a half ago, I guess that's when that was, it was mm-hmm. a party at our house, and half the people here were clients. Okay. Right? Because they're friends. So, right, because they're yeah. friends and because they care. And there was lots of free liquor because mm-hmm. they sent us like <laughs> 40 bottles of Hennessy, <laughs> which also speaks to the relationship. Yeah. And it was great. And that was like, I was very happy with that mm-hmm. because it's like, it's not purely transactional. Now, some of it is. Yeah. There are a lot of those. There's some people I say, I don't want to work with you anymore. You're mm-hmm. annoying. You drive me nuts. Yeah. No. Can't. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, it's just, most of it runs really well. Mm-hmm. Most of it runs really smooth. Cool, cool. So you mentioned shower, recent dad, year. Yeah, uh, yeah. You'll year, meet him. Year and a half. Yeah, he's a year and a half. He's well, sixteen months. Like, sixteen it's months. It's like okay. all, we could round it up to a year and a half. Okay. I, I want to get to the point where we could stop saying months because uh-huh. that's annoying. Because I don't remember who. <laughs> I don't think it was easy the first six, uh-huh. but now it's like, wait, sixteen months. So he's like yeah, a year, and like four months. It's like these weird <laughs> fractions that I don't want to like figure out. You know. Yeah. So what has that been like? Have you always been to be a dad? Oh yeah, I have. I wanted to be a dad. Yeah, mm-hmm. always. Um, didn't know when it, when it would happen, you know. I just really uh, thought it would be great, you know, to be a dad. Mm-hmm. And we just waited and we 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 waited. And then finally he showed up. And then this is, you know, you cool. get moments like this picture maybe mm-hmm. that you're seeing in front of you where it's like every morning if I'm in town, we yeah. wake up and we have, you know, we have a moment where me and mm-hmm. him go out. And we, I just make time every day to do something with him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and then now we share everything on Instagram because yeah. it's there. But, he, you know, he's like, I mean, if you see a picture, he looks like me. He looks just like me, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. except he's black. And he could, so he'll be at a dunk, <laughs> you know, white. And I can't even make a free throw. But, you know, so that's great. So he's like, he's like a better me. Uh-huh. You know, he could dance too, probably better than I. I can't dance and he already can dance. Okay. So like, and, and he's like smart and he's like, you know, he's funny. He's like all the greatest qualities of me. And like, apparently, like none of my bullshit made it through. Okay. <laughs> So, it's awesome it's like a flawless me it's like all my good stuff and none of the bad stuff uh-huh. and it's truly the reason I get up in the morning yeah and it's the reason I just grind all mm-hmm. the time what, 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 what made you want to be a dad um not the crying that you might be hearing in the mm-hmm. background right now um man who wouldn't want to be a dad you know who wouldn't want to share their path and um their journey mm-hmm. with somebody who comes from you you know teach them how to be a, a real person yeah. in the world and um yeah it's it's been uh it's just fun i what a crazy thing is i kind of wanted a girl we thought we were gonna have a girl yeah. 
We had a name picked out. Oh, really? And we just knew it was a girl. And then we found out it was a boy. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, shit, this is weird. We had the name. We didn't, we didn't have any, you know, everything. I, we had, like, the nursery thinking what it was going to be. Uh-huh. And then, like, a couple months before he was born, found out it was a boy. We didn't have, like, scientific proof it was a girl. We just mm-hmm. felt that it was going to be a girl, you know? And then we didn't have a name until the day he was born. Okay. He came a week early. And my wife, who you'll, you'll meet after this, she uh, texted me. Like, we had dinner with a friend the night before. And... um I remember the whole night. We were in Brooklyn Heights, like a potato restaurant, Grand Electrica. We were sitting mm-hmm. under the Brooklyn Bridge, and he was a really good mediator, and he was helping yeah. us come up with a name. And we were going back and forth, and it wasn't a very good conversation. Mm-hmm. And in the morning, she was so pregnant, she couldn't even sleep in the bed. She was on the stairs on the couch. Oh, really? And uh, she texted me, like, I'll give you this first name. I'll give you the, I'll give you this as a middle name if you give me this as a first name. Okay. I was like, all right. I'm I'm down with that, and then I come downstairs, and she's on the couch like, I think I ate bad Mexican, and I'm like, well, let's call the doctor. Uh-huh. And six hours later, this dude was popped here. out. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. We didn't have the bag packed. You know, you're uh-huh. supposed to have a no bag. bag by the door. You're supposed to have the bag like by the door. <laughs> we have any of that shit. It was just like I grabbed like a phone charger, uh-huh. booked her mom a flight. Her mom lives in Detroit. Booked her mom a flight while we were in like filling out the paperwork. Her mom ran to the airport. Uh, flew here, landed a couple hours after mm-hmm. Miles was born, and took an Uber to the hospital. Like it was just like, yeah. you know, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. But, Is there uh, like a fear or scared? Like, am I going to do this right? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think I'm. I think I will do it right. Mm-hmm. I think I am doing it right. And I don't know if there is a right or wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think my dad was honestly the greatest dad, but I think he probably did the best he could. You know. I've learned to not really fault people who mm-hmm. do the best they can considering because what's the point of why hold that, you yeah. know? What's the point of that? Mm-hmm. That doesn't really gain you anything. I just try to do the best I can. I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of shit. I've seen a lot more stuff than most people in the world have seen yeah. based on what I've done, the people I've been around. And I remember as a kid playing with food stamps because I didn't know what they were, but mm-hmm. then I didn't realize what, that we had them. Okay. Right? Like, that didn't, didn't realize that, like, that that was probably not good that we had them, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they were just, they were there. Like, but the fact that they were in our house, you know, they didn't just show up. Yeah. Like, nobody was just like, here's a book of food stamps to play with, right? So we had those. We weren't poor, but yeah. we weren't, we didn't, we weren't, we, 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 there was a part of our childhood where we were very, very lower class, and then it kind of transitioned to middle class. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know what I am now, you know, if, if, if I lived in like, Iowa, I'd probably be upper class. Okay. I think in Brooklyn, New York, I'm probably middle class. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my neighbors, I've, I've, I have neighbors who make like billions uh-huh. of dollars a year. So I'm like homeless compared to them. Right? <laughs> but, um, you know, so uh, what was I going with that? Oh, so yeah, so you just, you just do the best you can. But I've just seen enough stuff and all. What I'm excited about to share with him is I – you know, I, I understand the value of hard work. Mm-hmm. I had a job from seventh grade to the day I went away to college. All I knew in my whole life was work. Yeah. You know, work, 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 work. I, and then I always felt like I never really worked a day in my life because I never worked for somebody. Mm-hmm. But I also probably worked harder for me than I ever worked would have worked for yeah. anybody else. So literally from whatever year seventh grade was until right now, I've never not been working okay. my ass off. And I'm going to teach him that. Mm-hmm. But... I've also seen plenty of amazing rewards from that. Not as many as I'd like, but a lot more than maybe I'm entitled to. Yeah. And I'm going to teach him that too. And if he understands that, yeah, we just had a great Thanksgiving, but you should also go do some service and help some people who don't. Mm-hmm. And he understands, yeah, like daddy got booked to go to Cannes, but you're not going. You didn't get booked. Yeah. You know what I mean? But maybe I'll take you to Florida. You know okay. what I mean? Like you have to understand like the, the pros and cons of, mm-hmm. all, of all of that stuff and have that balance because he's not going to grow up silver spoon, you know, in yeah. his mouth and all of that stuff. But he's going to understand taste and culture and mm-hmm. class and design and things that he's privileged to be around in like in this city, you know, because that's why we're here. Yeah. If I wanted to raise him somewhere else, I'd go and save all this money. <laughs> but you know there's a there's a benefit to being raised as a child in New York City that sets you apart from anywhere yeah. else in the world I think and going back to you saying like you know uh, letting people off the hook how'd you get to that to having that mind state I guess forgiving people for 
I'm, I'm not really good at it. Okay. Um, but you're aware of it. I'm aware of it, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's say it's that. It's a little further along. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cause I've made a lot of mistakes. I mean, not like gravitational pulling mistakes, but mm-hmm. like, you know, what's the point of of being mad? You know, yeah. I've gotten better. I used to get like, when somebody would piss me off, I used to be pissed for like a week. And mm-hmm. now it's like four hours, five hours. Okay. Depends, depends. It's when it goes That's up to two, it goes up to two days, but it can go as little as one second. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it's much better. The the, the spread uh-huh. is much okay. smaller. And how'd you get to that? Freaking the spread. Just, uh, growing up, mm. growing up. Just, why? That's time I could be using to make money yeah. for my son. Cool. That's time I could be using to spend with my son and be present versus like be mad. Sitting mm-hmm. there thinking about all this shit. Why? I mean, you got to think about it. You're a human yeah. being, and you have to work through it. But I'm not going to go for a walk with him and not and be thinking about who just screwed yeah. me over. I mean, the thing is, that you're like they're not even thinking about you. No, they're not. They're not <laughs> thinking about you. So, but but you know who is thinking about me is is Miles. Yeah. So I should be totally, totally, totally like, hey, in Give there, you know. And I'm not great at it, but. It's a process, yeah. and it's and every day is getting better. And you know, hopefully by the time he's eighteen, I'll have to figure okay. out. <laughs> so career-wise, what do you have like things on the horizon next year? Um, about talk about. Yeah, man. I mean, a lot of stuff. I do a lot of like angel investing in companies, which is a big passion of mine. Right now, I'm part of three companies: uh, Localer, which is a really, really, really dope travel app where any city you go to, you can experience how you would tell somebody to do something in Manhattan and Mm -hmm. I would tell somebody how to do something in Brooklyn and not like Yelp where it's like ads of like, you know, whoever pays and all that. It's going really well. We've done a lot of partnerships with like Tablet Hotels and JetBlue and stuff. So that's really great. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm part of a company called Dot Dot Dash based in Portland. They do amazing experiential VR, 3D event stuff. So they helped a lot with Complex Con. They've done a lot of work with Pepsi and Mountain Dew. Um, they're doing really cool stuff. I'm really proud of those guys. I just invested in an app called, you should actually check it out. It's mm-hmm. called Anchor. Okay. Um, okay, I was it's, just about it. Yeah, yeah, Anchor is kind of like podcasting meets Twitter. Okay. It's like shorter versions of like audio content. Mm-hmm. It's really easily digestible and consumable. And um, I'll have to send you an invite. They, they do all these um, little kind of like panels and discussions about uh, – the future of audio and, and, mm-hmm. and wh- how we're going to consume it as, okay. as people. I think you'd find it really interesting okay, yeah. based on not audio as in like music per se, mm-hmm. but like audio just talking and communicating and how we, how we get our stuff because obviously with the resurgence of podcasts mm-hmm. all these years later, like people are coming back around to it and I'm always looking for more stuff like that. You know, if I was rich, I'd do a whole bunch more, yeah. but I'm very selective of what I put my, first of all, my time and my brand and, and then my money as well mm-hmm. into um, but I love it. It's a yeah. huge passion of mine. You know, I'd like that's like one day, maybe in ten years, to have my own VC. I think mm-hmm. that's very, that's a huge, huge, huge passion yeah. of mine. A lot of my friends are in VC and um, or come from similar worlds. That's kind of like where I'm gearing my life okay. towards, like that sort of stuff. Um, doing a lot of like brand stuff as well, as far mm-hmm. as like consulting them on lots of levels, whether it's musical stuff, which is like kind of like a layup. I'm doing a lot of like social influencer stuff for brands. I'm currently working with Cadillac right now. They're an amazing partner. Um, what else? I'm I'm speaking to companies now on creativity mm-hmm. and culture. I just did a big talk at Twitter two weeks ago talking okay. about my journey and how I've used creativity to get to where I'm at. And you know, I find that very fascinating too. And I love the idea. I, I want to give a TED talk maybe in like 2018. Mm-hmm. That's a goal. So I hope. Ted's listening, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever his name is. Uh, and uh, there's just so many things that this talent of mine has manifested yeah. in me in different ways and enables me to share it with the world. So I just love the fact that I didn't think as an adult that DJing would lead me to all these yeah. other things. I want to write a book next year. I have you know some ideas on mm-hmm. that. Um, 
Man, so much. Yeah. You know, the one thing I don't want to do is everyone's like, oh, you should just be a music producer. No. Yeah. I want to leave a bigger mark on the world. Okay. And I'm fortunate that my DJing has allowed me to do that. Mm-hmm. Is there like a thread between the stuff you choose to do? Uh, no. Like what makes you choose it? or? No. You would think there would be, mm-hmm. right? But there's not. Like, I don't, uh, the tech stuff isn't really music based. Though everyone was like, oh, you're going to invest in like a DJ app? No. Um, the brand stuff is all across the board, you know. It just excites you. So. It just excites okay. me. Like, I just try to find things that really speak to me. So, like, I love travel. I love experiential tech. I love, obviously, like, audio. Mm-hmm. I love luxury. I love sneakers. I love, you know, I'm doing a collaboration next year with a brand um, based out of Portugal called Last Soul. And okay. A really awesome shoe company that's just starting out there. And they have a lot of really great people from the European fashion scene involved. And I'm going to do a capsule with them, I believe, next year. That's going to be very exciting. Yeah. I don't think people would be expecting that from me, so that's pretty fun. I don't know, dude. Every day I wake up and I check my email mm-hmm. and I yell down to my wife, like, holy shit, how do these people find me? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'll do that, sure. Okay. And then a lot of times it's like, no, absolutely not. But the ones that break through, I'm just like, yeah, yeah. How, how did this happen? And those are the moments when you asked me before, like, how do you know that like you've reached, like, a, a, like what were your breakthrough moments? Mm-hmm. I don't really notice them at the time. Mm-hmm. But when I look back, like, the stuff I've gotten to do this year versus what I got to do the year before, the year before, I mean, you take back and you really look at it. Yeah. You're like, oh, thank God, mm-hmm. you know? That sounds like a great book there. Dude. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> well, thank you, Mick. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you for doing this. This is fun. Thank sure, you. Sure. Thank you. Sorry for the... I know we were supposed to do this a while ago, and my no, schedule no, just I understand. kept getting nuts. And I actually almost had to cancel on you again, but uh-huh. I ended up not going out of town yesterday. So I, I didn't... I, felt, I was like, oh, this guy's going to kill me. <laughs> so it worked out really well. Cool. And one last thing, people can reach you online. Yeah, my place. website is mick.co not dot com the guy who owns mick dot com his job is to take underwater photos of women okay you should you could check it out it's uh-huh. actually really i don't know how you discover that your skill <laughs> it's kind of awesome like what are you doing it's like oh i'm really for every part really i'm really really good at taking <laughs> naked water pictures uh-huh. um but that's not my site okay. it's mick dot co uh, but if people want to go there they can't yeah it's still it. worth checking out it's just it's <laughs> interesting i mean that guy has a way cooler job than i do uh <laughs> really he's the coolest job in the world and um my instagram's just at mick you mm-hmm. kind of keep follow along the journey okay great instagram by the way thank you i try i try a lot of baby pictures uh-huh. but they're at least they're good baby pictures you okay, know cool. we've got the hdr mode on the camera <laughs> so they look all right cool mick thank you thank you appreciate it sure and there you have it, my conversation with Mick. I hope you enjoyed it. Interesting guy, very inspiring. His website, again, is mick.co and on Instagram at Mick. And you can check out his digital mixtapes on Mixcloud. That's mixcloud.com forward slash Mick. As for me, I am online several places, talkmusictalk.com for more information on the podcast. I have my own personal website. This is boys.com for information on my books and music because I write books and I make music. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at this is boys. And don't forget the call to action at the top of the show. Please share this episode on social media if you enjoyed it. It really does help spread the word. Also, take the survey at talkmusictalk.com forward slash survey. And don't forget, download the app. It is free for iPhone and Android, wherever you get your apps. Or you can subscribe to the podcast on Google Play or iTunes. Just leave a rating and or review in the store wherever you listen Also, I am on SoundCloud. Just search for Talk Music Talk on there. And all of the episodes since 100 are on there. We'll be putting all the rest back soon to soonish. I promise. I hope you enjoyed this episode 112. And if you subscribe to the podcast, make sure you check out the previous episode 111. It's the year in mixtape show featuring over 30 musical guests from the podcast from 2016, including Vijay Iyer, 
Donnie McCaslin, he is the band leader and saxophonist who played on Bowie's last album, Black Star. Great, great music. Plus, you will hear a song from yours truly. That's on there. You will enjoy the whole three-hour show. That is on SoundCloud also. Thank you so much for listening to episode 112 with Mick. I hope you enjoyed it. Till next time, and there will be a next time. This one's for you, Liz. Liz.